this is a continuation of uh, part one of this video and this is part two. So in part one we had just discussed the wall of the gastrointestinal tract and its various layers. Uh, so the muscularis layer has two or three layers. So the place where it has three layers is actually the stomach. And we saw how everywhere else there are two layers of muscles within the muscularis which is the uh, deeper circular muscle and the superficial longitudinal muscle. So this is circular and longitudinal muscles. In the stomach, because there is a need for that churning type movement, there is an additional layer called the oblique layer that we will go over when we discuss the stomach in particular. Now the uh, part of the enteric nervous system that lives here um, in the muscularis layer is the myenteric plexus, also known as the Auerbach plexus. And it's sort of wedged or sandwiched between the two layers, uh, the circular and longitudinal. So it kind of lives, those uh, neurons and nerve endings live between the circular and the longitudinal muscles. Now an important point to note that there are cells called interstitial cells that live as part of the myenteric plexus and they work as little cellular pacemakers. So uh, they usually have depolarization every uh, in a rhythmic fashion every few seconds that cause uh, the peristalsis and the segmentation type movements within the, these two muscular layers. So to recap, the enteric nervous system is composed of the submucosal plexus and the myenteric plexus. And we already discussed what the serosa is. So serosa is the outer packaging that's made up of connective tissue, uh, such as the dense irregular connective tissue. Um, it also goes by the name adventitia. Now the parts of your gastrointestinal tract and the accessory structures of the digestive system that live in the abdominal cavity live within a compartment within an abdominal cavity known as the peritoneum. So peritoneum is a double layered compartment, meaning that it has a visceral layer, which is towards the side of the organs or the deeper of the two layers. And it has a parietal side, the parietal peritoneum, which which is the more superficial and towards the body wall. So organs um, such as the stomach, liver, pancreas, the gallbladder, um, all of your accessory structures and the parts of the GI tract that live in the abdominal cavity live in the peritoneum or peritoneal chamber. Now, there are certain organs, uh, such as the kidneys, pancreas, and duodenum, that live outside or behind um, the peritoneum, and they're called retroperitoneal in position. So peritonitis is a condition where one of the peritoneal um, membranes get inflamed. So peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum, and ascites is when water migrates out of the gastrointestinal tract or the blood and it sort of pools in the peritoneum, given the, the abdomen sort of a distended appearance. So what you're looking at here is structures that sort of tether uh, various organs in the abdominal cavity. So right here in the upper right quadrant, you are noticing the liver. Here is the stomach right here. And a band of connective tissue that tethers the stomach and liver, which I'm shading on right now, <clears throat> that is called the lesser omentum. The lesser omentum. And as soon as you open the skin and the musculature in the abdominal layer, the skeletal musculature, you come across sort of like a layer of um, adipose tissue that forms like a curtain-like sheet 
uh, covering most of your small intestine and parts of your large intestine. So this um, structure in yellow, and I'm going to shade on it in blue right here, is called the greater omentum. And there are sort of globs of fat and adipose tissue that make up the greater omentum. Now, when you reflect the greater omentum open right here, you expose your small intestine, which is also moved out of the place right here. So if you move the small intestine out of the place, you notice that the small intestine is tethered to the posterior wall right here and right here. So the small intestine being tethered to the posterior wall is called the mesentery. And the tether around the colon up here, this structure in the back, that is called the descending colon. So what you're seeing right here, again, in image C, this is the mesentery. And the one around the colon is called the mesocolon. So these are structures that tether and keep these digestive organs in place and prevent them from displacing around within the abdominal cavity. So now we're going to go compartment by compartment within this tube. We're, I have a separate PowerPoint for all accessory structures, but we're going to start with the oral cavity and we're going to talk about the histology uh, and the basic anatomy. A lot of the anatomy we will be doing in lab when we meet, but the basic anatomy is also covered um, in these lecture videos. So this particular PowerPoint will have um, the video uh, will have um, information about the GI tract itself, and there will be a separate PowerPoint for the accessory structures. So we're starting here with the over uh, with the oral cavity and the oral cavity is surrounded or or we open our oral cavity by two lips. Here's the upper lip and the lower lip. You guys already know which muscles help elevate the upper lip and depress the lower lip. So the upper lip is tethered to your gums with a structure called the labial frenulum up here. You have an upper labial frenulum up there and you have a lower labial frenulum right here. Now the teeth here, out of all the teeth um, on the maxilla and the mandible, the, these two are your central incisors followed by your lateral incisors. Then we have uh, your canines, followed by premolars, and then the first, second, and third molars right here on the side. Now, the top roof of your oral cavity is called the palate. And within the palate, the anterior portion here is called the hard palate, and the posterior portion here is called the soft palate. And back here, if you look in the mirror and open your mouth wide, you have this hanging structure, which is called the uvula. Now, the uvula has to do with the gag reflex, and it prevents something too large to go down your esophagus or even your throat and it prevents choking. So that white hashed line over here. So if you see a lateral to the uvula, you have two arches. So this arch here that I'm drawing on and then this arch here, those arches are called fauces. So that's the archway, the, the two arches around your uvula that are like the gateway into the throat. And now a very important structure right here, here's where you see the tongue. And the tongue is tethered to the floor of the mouth by the lingual frenulum. So this, what you're seeing here, is the lingual frenulum. The soft tissue that is on the bottom of your teeth 
or your gums, that is called gingiva. Gingivitis is inflammation of your gum. So the oral vestibule itself is space, your buccal cavity, your tongue, and the space in your mouth. Um, and it is lined with stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Now the enzymatic secretions of the mouth are secreted into the oral cavity by salivary glands. Now we have three types of salivary glands and they are a type of compound akinar gland. So you see right here that the gland, it's a multi-lobar or, or it's called an akinus, multi-lobar gland. They're typically lined with cuboidal epithelium, as you can see here in this histology slide, in this light micrograph, I'm going to use the yellow color. So you see the lumen right here, and it is surrounded by a simple cuboidal epithelium. And they make saliva, and the saliva is transported to the oral cavity through a salivary duct. And saliva contains enzymes called salivary amylase, which breaks down starch. So starch is a polysaccharide, which is essentially repeated units of C6, H12, and O6, which is uh, glucose. So it's repeated units of that. So salivary amylase breaks down starch. It also secretes something called lingual lipase. So amylase, lipase, so anything that ends with an ACE is an enzyme. So lingual lipase is an enzyme for lipid digestion. Now what saliva does, saliva is secreted into your oral cavity and it helps form a bolus. So once you've chewed food up, saliva mixes with it and helps form a softer mass that is easier to swallow and we're not going to call it food we're going to call it bolus so bolus is something uh it, it's the mass of material that you have chewed and is mixed with saliva which is ready for swallowing saliva also contains bicarbonate ions which is the um, hco3 minus that helps with regulating pH and it also contains small amounts of an enzyme called lysozyme. So if you recall your um, uh, eukaryotic cell structures, these are this enzyme is also secreted by lysosomes and this is a mild antimicrobial. So to recap all of the enzymes that are present in saliva, you have the salivary amylase, you have lingual lipase, bicarbonate ions for pH regulation, as well as lysozyme, which is a mild antimicrobial. Here's another um, slide that is self-study, which basically goes and lays out the enzyme secretions of every single um, gland in the digestive system. So put a star mark on this diagram. Uh, as you are studying and making notes, I suggest making a table that talks about uh, the enzymatic secretion, the gland that secretes it, and its function. Now bolus from the oral cavity is swallowed. Deglutition is the name for swallowing. Mastication is the name for chewing. So the next place where bolus is going to go is actually the pharynx. So pharynx is essentially your throat. And we have three sections of the pharynx. From the proximal to the distal, the one that is right behind your uvula is called the oropharynx. And this is the most proximal one. The second in line is the laryngopharynx which is right where your voice box is, um, is uh, positioned. On top of or, or superior to the oropharynx, we have something called the 
nasopharynx. So nasopharynx being the superior most, bolus typically doesn't go into your nasopharynx, although it is part of the pharynx. So as far as we're concerned with digestive system, bolus actually first goes through your oropharynx and then goes through your laryngopharynx. And we have muscles around our throat that help us swallow. And these are really deep muscles. They're not very strong. They're very strong in um, animals such as constrictors, uh, snakes that squeeze their prey to, to death. But pharyngeal constrictors in humans just allow us to swallow. Now, another structure that basically shunts food away from your voice box or the larynx and prevents it from going down your, um, your uh, windpipe or trachea is called the epiglottis. So epiglottis is like a flap. So as you're swallowing, this flap covers your voice box or the larynx and prevents food from going into your airway. Now from the laryngopharynx, bolus is then transported to through a tube called the esophagus. The job of the esophagus essentially is to move bolus from point A, which is your pharynx, to point B, which is the stomach. Now there are two valves or sphincters in your esophagus. The first sphincter is located on the proximal end of your esophagus and it's called the upper esophageal sphincter. It is made up of striated or voluntary muscles. The, at the distal end is the lower esophageal sphincter and this is made up of smooth muscles and it is involuntary. So when these sphincters are too loose, especially the lower esophageal sphincter, a chronically loose um, lower esophageal sphincter results in something called GERD, which is gastrointestinal esophageal reflux disorder, where this valve, which is supposed to close and prevent uh, material from moving from the stomach upwards, is not closing completely or not closing at all. And as a result, um, acidified contents of the stomach can backflow up into the esophagus. Uh, when these sphincters are too tight, it is called achalasia, and that can result in people having um, trouble swallowing or getting a feeling that something is stuck in your throat um, and you're not able to fully swallow it. And the esophagus is posterior to your trachea and it passes through a hole in your diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. So esophageal hiatus is essentially a hole in the sheet-like transverse diaphragm and it attaches um, to the stomach. Now this is a highly mucosal surface within the esophagus and it is also made up of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, um, a lack of mucus production here could result in esophageal ulcers or, or pain with swallowing. So let's talk about the stomach. So I'm first, I'll, I'll go over the stomach. I'll go over the contents of the previous slide here as I go over the diagram. So what you're seeing here is the distal part of the esophagus itself. Now this is where the opening of the esophagus into the stomach is. And this is where your lower esophageal sphincter is positioned. Now the lower esophageal sphincter is smooth and involuntary muscle. Once stuff is dumped into the stomach, your lower esophageal sphincter is supposed to contract and prevent the backflow from the stomach back into the esophagus. Now the opening of the stomach itself is called the cardia or the cardiac aperture. It is this opening of the stomach through the esophagus. And stomach is classified into a few different regions. The superior portion of the stomach, which is sort of dome-like and conical, 
is called the fundus. The central portion here is called the body. The distal portion here is the funnel, and that region is called the pylorus. So you have the cardia, which is the, the opening itself. You have the fundus, which is the superior most dome, the body, which is the center, and the conical sort of funnel-like pylorus. Now let's go over the shape of the stomach itself. So the stomach has two curvatures. So this one, the left curvature here is called the greater curvature or the outside curvature. And this is called the lesser curvature. And out of this entire tube of the GI tract, the stomach also has all of those components that we talked about. So the stomach is going to have your mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa as well. The only difference here within the muscularis is in addition to your circular and longitudinal muscles, you have an additional layer of muscles called oblique muscles. And they are deeper to both your circular and longitudinal muscles. And this helps the mixing or the churn-like sort of thing, cement mixer movement within the stomach. So you don't want uh, material to just pass through and through. You want it churned and mixed with um, the secretions of the stomach itself. So you can notice the part of the diagram here has a frontal or coronal cut. And you're looking at the inside surface of the stomach itself. So you're seeing a lot of ridges and indents here. They're essentially like pleats or flaps, and they are called rugae. And the purpose of rugae is to increase stomach area. So a full stomach, allow, the rugae allow a full stomach to stretch. And when the stomach is empty, uh, the rugae are more prominent. So rugae essentially increase surface area of the stomach. And this conical sort of region um, of the stomach is called the pylorus. So here is where the distal end of the stomach actually is. And there's another valve here. So this is where the stomach ends and the small intestine begins. So the valve here that prevents backflow of stuff from the small intestine to the stomach is called the pyloric sphincter. And it, it closes once stuff passes through here, that is the normal di direction of movement, the pyloric sphincter prevents backflow from the small intestine back into the stomach. So this tube that you are seeing here is the proximal end of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. The, du uh, the duodenum is the proximal segment out of three segments of the small intestine. So as we talked about the layers of the walls of the gastrointestinal tract, we did talk about the, uh, the mucosa, which has the epithelium uh, and um, lamina propria and muscularis mucosae. Um, it also has the submucosa, and the only difference here is the presence of oblique muscles. Now let's look a little bit closer to the histology of the stomach. And I'm going to explain diagram number one first, and then we're going to look briefly at this light micrograph and diagram number two. So what you're seeing here, this area is the lumen of the stomach itself. And you can see the presence of rugae here. So this is a longitudinal cut. And first from here to here, you are seeing the mucosa of the stomach itself. So here you can see the rugae, the, which are these finger-like projections. And the indents here, are called gastric pits. 
So rugae are the folds and the indents are called gastric pits. And there are several types of cells that live here in gastric pits. We're going to talk about them in just a minute. The next layer here is your submucosa, which you can see is vascularized. And then you have the three layers of your muscularis externa. So over here, this is the deepest or the circular muscles. This is the, uh, or sorry, you have the deepest here in the uh, stomach, which is your oblique muscle. The middle one is your circular muscle and the outer one is the longitudinal muscle. Past which you have the adventitia or the serosa, which is essentially continuous with the visceral peritoneum. So in this light micrograph, you can notice that these right here, the, the folds are rugae, and the indents between the folds are your gastric pits. So you can see the spaces between these finger-like projections. Those are your gastric pits. Now we're going to see one, two, uh, or we're, we're going to see several different types of cells uh, live in the So um, gastric pits are openings for gastric glands, which are essentially uh, housing cells here that secrete all your gastric juices. And they're lined with simple columnar epithelium. So let's look at the cells that live inside these gastric pits. The first kind of cell that lives here is a mucous neck cell. Mucous neck cells are secreting a type of mucus that is a lot thicker and more viscous than regular mucus. And this thicker mucus basically prevents the hydrochloric acid um, that is secreted by your stomach from digesting your stomach wall itself. The second type of cell that lives here is the goblet cell, which secretes your regular mucus for lubrication. Then you have cells called parietal cells. Parietal cells are secreting hydrochloric acid. We're going to go over the physiology of how this is secreted. And they also secrete something called intrinsic factor. Now, intrinsic factor is a substance that you need in order to be able to absorb vitamin B12 from your diet. So inavailability or, or a mutation in which you cannot secrete intrinsic factor will result in the individual not being able to absorb any vitamin B12 uh, from their diet. And, and um, deficiency of vitamin B12 is, um, it causes a type of anemia called pernicious anemia. Next, you have chief cells. And chief cells are secreting um, two different things. First, they are secreting Chief cells are secreting a protease called pepsinogen and something called gastric lipase. We're going to talk more about this in just a minute. So pepsinogen is a precursor to something called pepsin. And pepsin is activated by hydrochloric acid. In addition to the above, you have gastric endocrine cells. Now, anything that's endocrine is not going to secrete stuff into a lumen here, so it's not going to get secreted into the lumen of the stomach. It is going to get secreted directly into blood. And for that reason, these are not called enzymes, they're called hormones. So the endocrine cells that live here are, one, are enterochromaffin cells that stimulate production of hydrochloric acid, they also secrete something called histamine. Next is a cell called a G cell, and G cell secretes gastrin. And then we have somatostatin containing cells. Somatostatin is something that inhibits gastrin and insulin secretion. And so, so somatostatin is secreted when the stomach's, when you're basically full. 
So here's what they look like. This is an illustration, not a light micrograph. So this is the lumen of the stomach up here. This is the opening of the gastric pit. You have your surface mucus or regular mucus cells, your goblet cells that secrete regular mucus. As you go deeper down the pit, you have your mucus neck cells that secrete the thicker, more viscous mucus that protects your stomach lining from the hydrochloric acid. Next, you have the parietal cell that is going to secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. You have your chief cells that are going to secrete gastric lipase and pepsinogen, which is a protease. And then finally, the most deepest cell here are types of endocrine cells, which are your chromaffin cells, um, your G cells, and uh, so forth. So let's look at the physiology of HCL production. So let's orient ourselves in the diagram first. Here is the duct of the gastric gland. So this is where the gastric pit is going to be, like that. This large bluish gray cell is your parietal cell. This is the interstitial space, and this is a blood capillary in the vicinity. So in step one, carbon dioxide, which is getting transported by your blood, enters the parietal cell and reacts with water. So here you see carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of an enzyme known as carbotic anhydrase, which is here represented here as the CA, forms something called carbonic acid, H2CO3. So the story begins as carbon dioxide is being transported in all your blood vessels. The parietal cell pulls the carbon dioxide where it reacts with water and the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is going to convert that to something called carbonic acid, which is that H2CO3 that you see here. The carbonic acid is unstable and it quickly dissociates. Carbonic acid is going to dissociate here into bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3 minus, and hydrogen ions. So if you look at H plus and HCO3 minus, you get the H2CO3. So it dissociates not into carbon dioxide and water, but when it dis dissociates, it dissociates into the bicarbonate ion and the hydrogen ion. Now what we're first concerned with here is the hydrogen ion because the acid here is hydrochloric acid. So the hydrogen ion here is one of the two components that you're going to need to produce hydrochloric acid. So this hydrochloric acid is dumped into your gastric pit. Now you just need the chloride. So chloride is also part, is getting pulled here from the blood vessels because it's a, an ion that is, it, that lives in blood. So here, the parietal cell also pulls the Cl- or the chloride ion and also dumps it into the gastric pit, which is where hydrogen ion and chloride ion, so H+, and Cl- make hydrochloric acid. Now let's go a little bit deeper into that process. So as hydrogen ion is dumped into the gastric pit, it is a anti-porting system. So for every hydrogen ion that is dumped into the gastric pit, a potassium ion is anti-ported into the parietal cell. It goes through the parietal cell and is dumped into your blood vessel. So as hydrogen ion is pulled from blood, a potassium ion is dumped into blood. As a chloride ion is dumped into the gastric pit, excess bicarbonate ion here, which is what the carbonic acid is associating and making, is also dumped into 
the blood vessel. So the bicarbonate ion, which is unnecessary here for hydrochloric acid production, is dumped into the blood vessel and the potassium ion is exchanged as part of the hydrogen ion. So stomach secretions actually begin, uh, happen in three phases. And the first phase is called a cephalic phase, happens in the brain. So anytime you uh, taste or smell food or even touch food, those thoughts stimulate your medulla oblongata. From there, parasympathetic action potentials are carried out by the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve number 10, directly to the stomach where your enteric plexus, which is part of your enteric uh, nervous system, those neurons get activated. So parasympathetic or enteric neurons here, enteric neurons stimulate your parietal and chief cells to secrete hydrochloric acid and pepsin respectively. And they stimulate the secretion of the hormone gastrin and histamine. So what happens to this gastrin is it's carried back. So gastrin is a hormone. Gastrin is not an enzyme. So gastrin is carried through blood back to the stomach where that, in addition with histamine, stimulate further secretion of hydrochloric acid and pepsin. So pepsin is secreted as pepsinogen. So the gen tells us that it is a precursor. So when pepsinogen comes in, uh, in contact with the hydrochloric acid, it gets activated to the active form of the protease known as pepsin. So pepsin digests proteins. The second phase is called the gastric phase. So filling or distension. So as bolus gets dumped into the stomach, so filling of the stomach or distension, stretching of the stomach wall from filling activates a parasympathetic. Remember, parasympathetic is rest and digest. So the vagus nerve, which is um, both an afferent and an efferent nerve, it carries signals back to the medulla oblongata. And the medulla oblongata further stimulates secretion of the stomach until the distension reaches a point. So as your stomach is filling up, the more full it gets, the more the stomach secretions of hydrochloric acid, pepsin, intrinsic factor, all of that is amplified. Um, and that feedback between the stomach and the medulla oblongata is happening by gastrin. So the last phase of stomach secretions, the intestinal phase, um, this is when stuff has already moved into the pyloric region and it's mixed with a lot of um, hydrochloric acid. So from here on out, we're not gonna call it bolus, we're gonna call it chyme. Now, chyme, as it passes through that pyloric sphincter and into the duodenum, it is fairly acidic with a pH of less than two. Now, here's what happens. The sensory input to the medulla oblongata from the duodenum decreases the motor input from medulla to the stomach. So at this point, we're going to start to wind down stomach secretions and not stimulate some stomach secretions, which is what happened in the gastric phase and the cephalic phase. Now this, when the medulla oblongata decreases motor input to the stomach, this stops the, the chief cells and the parietal cells from secreting additional pepsin and hydrochloric acid. And gastric secretion is therefore inhibited. Now as chyme starts to enter the duodenum, uh, the enterogastric reflex, it starts to wind down and inhibit the stomach and the hormones secretin and cholecystokinin are secreted in the duodenum. Um, and those go back to the stomach and tell the G cells to downregulate or wind down secretion of gastrin.
So this is a great table which I have marked as self-study and it talks about what the secretion is, where it is produced, what it does to stimulate, what its effects are, and what it does for what its sensory effects are and what its motor effects or motility effects are. So on your exam, please expect um, to get match the following or, or questions based on the information in this table. Now we have gone over the stomach, we're going to start going over the small intestine. So the small intestine begins on the distal side of that pyloric sphincter and there are three segments. This is the longest part of your gastrointestinal tube and the three segments here are denoted in three separate colors. So the proximal segment here in light blue is your duodenum. It is a short segment of your small intestine. So it is the first 25 centimeters of it. Then you have the middle segment, which is right here in the violet. And that's about 2.5 meters. It is the middle segment called the jejunum. And then the longest segment, which is also the distal segment, is here in the dark pink. It is called the ileum and that stands at 3.5 meters. So the ileum and jejunum is basically where nutrient and water absorption happens. Here you are looking at the mesentery, which is vascularized. This is your lower right quadrant where the ileum forms a junction with your colon. colon. Now the small intestine has ring-like structures called circular folds or plicae circularis. And we're going to look at what these look like in the lab. We have finger-like projections called villi that increase the surface area of the small intestine. They also have structures called lacteals, which are lymphatic structures and carry um, sort of waste materials um, from that tissue, from intestinal tissue through the lacteal and where it gets dumped into the lymphatic system. Now, the next structure is microvilli, and we have talked about this when we did your tissues chapter. So villi are microscopic, microvilli are microscopic. So both the structures, villi as well as microvilli, function in increasing surface area, one on the cellular level and one on the macro level. In addition to villi and microvilli, plicae circularis or circular folds creates sort of, um, if you've seen magic hoses and how they're crinkled and you can stretch them, that is what uh, the plicae circularis um, do for the entire small intestine. Um, microvilli in the small intestine is also referred to as the brush border. So let's look closely right here. Here's a cross section of the small intestinal tube here taken from the duodenum. Uh, so here you are looking at the macroscopic villi. Here you are seeing the ring-like structures, the plicae circularis. Now remember, this is part of your GI tract, so you're going to have your mucosa, submucosa, and muscularis externa in this tube as well. You, you only have the circular and the longitudinal muscles here. You do not have... Um, oblique muscles, which are part of the stomach itself. Now, this is what the villi look like. So this is the villus. Collectively, they're called villi. Now, within each villi or finger-like projection, you're seeing a red tube, which is an arteriole. You're seeing a blue tube, which is a venule. So together, they're blood vessels, vasculature. And you're also seeing a green tube here. So that green tube that lives within this finger-like projection, 
is called a lacteal and the lacteal is part uh, they're basically microscopic lymph tubules now on a cellular level what you're looking at here each cell has microvilli that i'm drawing on right now that you can see as brush border and the whole point of microvilli is to increase surface area now just like you had your gastric pits with the gastric glands in between villi here you have something called intestinal glands uh, so the indents between each villus are where your duodenal or your intestinal glands are going to live Now, the um, epithelium of your small uh, intestine is basically ciliated, simple columnar epithelium. The most abundant cells here are absorptive columnar cells. So these are the cells that have microvilli, they're going to produce more digestive enzymes, and their most important job is to absorb digestive food. And so when we say they're going to absorb digested food, they're going to absorb it into the bloodstream. And so in the previous slide where we saw there was a red and a blue blood vessel um, in each villus as well. So when, when absorptive cells absorb this, they're going to get absorbed into those blood capillaries. Uh, since we need lubrication here, we're also going to have goblet cells that produce mucus. And here we have cells called panet cells, that P-A-N-E-T-H, panet cells, that secrete a mild antimicrobial that uh, kill any bacteria that may have found, uh, found their um, way into the, this area. Uh, here, there are some glands that are basically pinched off. So they're separated from the base of um, the the indent and they are called crypts of libercune. So we're going to talk a little bit bit about the crypts of libercune um, in lab. But in the duodenum, we have an additional type of gland called Brunner's gland. And Brunner's gland secretes bicarbonate containing mucus that basically neutralizes that acidic chyme that is coming down from your stomach. So remember, the stomach contents have um, hydrochloric acid, and so they're fairly acidic uh, with a pH of 2 or less. So as chyme comes through the pyloric sphincter and into the duodenum, the Brunner's gland basically secrete this sort of bicarbonate containing mucus, so they basically protect the duodenum from being broken down by stomach acid, as well as secrete that bicarb that is going to neutralize that acid. So the duodenum, which is the shortest and the most proximal segment of your small intestine, um, it, it curves a little bit to the left. And right by where the duodenum is, you're going to notice an accessory structure lives there, uh, the pancreas. So we're going to talk about the pancreas in the accessory um, organs lecture. But the duodenum has two little pore-like openings. Those two little pore-like openings are called major and minor duodenal papillae. So the major duodenal papillae brings all the secretions from the liver and gallbladder and dumps it into the, uh, the duodenum. And the minor duodenal papilla brings in secretions from the pancreas and dumps it into the duodenum as well. So both those accessory structures, your liver and pancreas, secrete important digestive materials. But since chyme, does not flow through them, the contents, uh, the secretions of the pancreas and liver and gallbladder are dumped into the duodenum itself through the major and minor duodenal papillae, respectively. The next two segments are the jejunum and ileum. So as um, you go down, there's a gradual decrease 
in diameter because the wall of the intestine, the wall becomes thicker and thicker. Um, because here there's going to be a lot of nutrient absorption. You have structures called Peyer's patches here, which are basically microscopic lymphatic nodules, lymph nodes, microscopic lymph nodes. So any sort of uh, microbial secretions or anything that needs to be dealt with from the lymphatic system uh, go from the lacteals into the Peyer's patches. Now at the distal end of the ileum is where you have something called the ileocecal junction. This is in your lower right quadrant and it has a valve called the ileocecal sphincter. So the small intestine ends with the ileocecal sphincter and the colon or the large intestine begins. So some of the things that are secreted in the small intestine are collectively known as brush border enzymes. So in lab, we're going to all collectively make a table uh, talking about all of the um, types of glands and secretions and functions of the small and large intestine. Uh, but some of them that are collectively called brush border enzymes are called diasaccharidases, which break down disaccharides into monosaccharides and peptidases, which break down individual peptide bonds. So the large intestine here basically extends from right here, your ileocecal junction to your anal opening. So we're in the right lower quadrant here. Here you can see the ileum. There's your ileocecal valve or ileocecal sphincter. Now this proximal end, this little square proximal end of your colon goes by the name cecum. From the cecum, you go into the ascending colon. This is called, this right angle bend is called the hepatic flexure or right colic flexure, followed by the transverse colon. Then you have the splenic flexure, also known as the left colic flexure, and the descending colon right here. Now in your lower left quadrant, there's an S bend which is known as your sigmoid colon, followed by a little conical region where feces is stored. And then you have the anal canal, followed by the anal orifice or anal opening. Now, movement is slower in your colon than it is uh, upstream um, in, or uh, in your small intestine. So here, um, you are looking at the mesocolon, which is like the mesentery, but it attaches your colon. Now, each sort of uh, segment here, you're seeing blocks of segments. So just like we had plicae circularis in the small intestines, we have these like nodular sort of bands. Those are called haustra or haustrum. And there's a band of connective tissue that runs along the middle of the entire length of the colon right here, that is called the tinea coli. You see some adipose tissue structures sort of hanging off. Those are kind of like the greater omentum. They're called omental appendages here as well. Now, mostly there is absorption of water and salts in the colon. It is a mucousy surface, so you are going to see um, presence of a lot of goblet cells. And we have a lot of microorganisms that are part of the normal flora of your colon. So these uh, bacteria that live in the colon help us break down a certain materials and absorption of vitamin K and, and things like that. So um, it is important to have these normal bacteria in your colon. They play an important role with your digestion. And when you are on long-term antibiotics, um, it also kills that a normal microbiota in your colon and that can cause symptoms of indigestion.
So here you are seeing each individual haustrum, collectively known as haustra. You are seeing the central band called tinea coli right there. Now, finally, we are going to look at the defecation reflex. So once, so it's chyme when it goes through your small intestine. And once it comes into your colon, it is then starting to become feces. So let's see what the defecation reflex is. So as stuff moves through the colon, from the cecum to the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, it fills up and, and the colon becomes wider. So first the colon becomes, or the rectum becomes distended because there's feces filling it. So feces pushes against the walls of the rectum. So second, because there is pressure on the walls of the rectum, there are parasympathetic signals coming from the brain that are relaxing your internal anal sphincter. So internal anal sphincter relaxes and feces is pushed outwards. In step number three, there are two anal sphincters, right? The internal anal sphincter is right here and then you have the external anal sphincter right here. The internal anal sphincter is involuntary, the external anal sphincter is voluntary. So when the internal anal sphincter relaxes, feces is pushed outwards and it, it puts some pressure against that external anal sphincter. So the external anal sphincter um, is voluntary and when this is relaxed, that is when feces comes down and uh, is excreted out of your body. So I'm going to stop here because uh, it's getting uh, the file is getting pretty big. But the next lecture will be about um, accessory structures.